Can't hear anybody. Yeah. Nope, I can't hear anything. Uh, motion to put the minutes of uh, November 2023rd meeting. There was no meeting in December. So moved. Second. I have a motion, a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, they have a uh, I'd like to uh, approve the policy review committee meeting calendar for 2024. <laughs> All meetings will take place at 4 30 here in the Carl T. Secor Administrative Center boardroom and virtually via Zoom and YouTube. The, uh, Anyone make Second. a motion? Second. Um, I have a motion. Second. Any discussion? Those dates are good for everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's basically we're just piggybacking at this time yeah. right before the painting. Uh, all in favor. All in, fa all in favor. Aye. 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 Good. Um, okay. Now we're on to policies for discussion. Now these policies presented are being presented by the administration. Uh, so I'm going to actually refer to the administration on a few things. And I guess, are you the administrative contact tonight? Oh, Dr. So. Yep. Who, one of, okay. Um, so first off for uh, discussion is policy 200 enrollment in the district. Uh, looking at this policy, it looks like we basically are just uh, changing the layout. Now we're putting the references to legal references to the back of the the document instead of the sides now? Yes, from a formatting perspective, that is correct. You'll also note on page one of three, you'll see a section there that has been stricken, mm -hmm. that has simply been moved to another portion of the policy a few yeah, we later. Did. We have a heading now for students experiencing educational instability because that is a newer term that the state has been using to reference the subjects thereafter. The major addition here, Mr. Carcutt, is the addition of the children of active duty military families. It's in response, and that's really what the next several policies are going to be responding to before this evening. We, we duplicated that in a bunch of different policies throughout this, did we not? Yes, yeah, so in the next several policies, you'll see that included as well because it's applicable in the other settings. And then you'll also see a new policy here <laughs> That backs all of this up, Correct. the policy 254 that addresses the entire subject as a whole. The only question I have is uh, why can't we uh, uh, ask about the kid, uh, the children's or their parents' uh, immigration status? It says we can't ask about the students' status, and that's been longstanding practice in Pennsylvania. Yeah. However, because whether one is whether the child is here legally or not, PD is determined is irrelevant as, to, as far as their education. Self education. I oh, know. Yeah. Well, to yeah. me, so we can't inquire of that of the students' at immigration status. However, I, I just have a tough time with that. That's all. Yeah, we still we still require the residency, uh, the residency requirements for the parent are still intact. So that's does the doing. parent have to be a, a legal uh, immigrant? The parent has to be a resident. Does so the parent have to be a legal immigrant? Uh, legal immigrant. They could be in the process of obtaining naturalization. Okay, I'll ask you another way. If they're an illegal immigrant. Generally, no. They have to, if you look at our policy 201, they would have to have some form of documentation from the federal government that they can't produce anything for us. Say they can't produce a deed, they can't produce a lease, they can't produce a license, they can't produce a pay stub, they can't produce automobile registration. They would have to provide so some set of documentation from the federal government indicating why they cannot. So they could be in the process. We also have those who come here as immigrants that are homeless. They may have been fleeing another country, and the federal law requires we take them as well. I understand that. Just... 
So just for reference sake, I know Debbie in uh in the last year at the meetings you read everything. Um I read the changes. The changes. Um other than the changes, other than the addition of uh it would be uh the the uh children of active military families. Does anyone have did everyone have a chance to review that? Do you want me to read it word for word or are we okay with that? I it. It's I always just read it so it was on the record. Okay, well, we can read it, but it's going to, the district shall facilitate the timely enrollment and permit uh, advanced enrollment of children of active duty military families in accordance with law and board policy to qualify for, for advanced enrollment. Prior to establishing residency in the district, a copy of the official military orders shall be provided to the district along with proof of parent slash guardian's intention to move into the district. Parent guardian must provide proof of residence with 45 days after the arrival date stated in the military space, basically he said he had to provide agency. Well, that's that's for the military part. Yeah, but I'm just, and I'm just well, I the military part. And then, and then the next one, we're striking the district shall inquire about immigration. However, that's listed below and we're striking the other one and that's listed on the other, uh, right there too, also. I have one other question. And that's the, pretty the, much the it. AR. What's up? Do you do the AR, Dr. Riker, or can we get a copy of the AR? The AR for? It says superintendent or designee uh, shall develop and disseminate administrative regulations for the enrollment of eligible students. So we should have an AR. Yeah, well, yeah, we have them where needed. They're really standard operating procedures here. But yes, we have them and you can you can do those. So Would if like I have four, I'll get one. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. Any other comments on this particular policy? It's pretty uh pretty specific. I don't know. Nope. Going on to uh People's attendance eligibility policy 202. It looks like this is uh, still we're addressing the military families on page uh, five, where it says the children of active military families shall be eligible for enrollment in the district in accordance with interstate compact on educational opportunity for military children, state law and board policy. And then I think the rest of it is uh, just some cleaning up of your legal legal documentation. Yeah, it's moving references out of the left margin to a footnote on the end. Are we going to widen it then eventually, like most boards do? We are going to be making other format changes because we also want to make these policies searchable on your website. Correct. They presently are. Correct. That's that's why I was at. Yeah, yeah, a lot of school boards have the full documentation. That's good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any questions on this particular policy? No. Like I said, these are all recommendations by the administration. Uh, now we're on to uh, 214 class rank. Um, if looking through this policy, um, I can take a gist that we are striking all the temporary revisions we made due to COVID-19, taking them out because COVID-19 doesn't exist anymore. Right. And they will forever, <laughs> and they will forever appear in the next I'm talking on page... 214. Oh, we're looking at it's uh, yeah, Basically, it looks like we're taking out, and that's and that we're taking out all the uh, COVID related. However, we're we're making some changes. I don't know if we're taking out the COVID related. It looks like we we take out uh, the wording and putting it into a graph. Both. So on that's page saying, two of four, it removes the temporary COVID provisions. And yep. you are correct. This was prompted by a review and a meeting that was held with Dr. Vitulli. Uh, Ms. Polmonter was part of that as well, who I believe stepped out for a moment. Mm -hmm. And it had to do with making sure that our policy supported the new direction the district was taking with its dual credit program with the college courses. So as they were reviewing the program of studies in that meeting, it was noted that some of the items that we, or some of the direction we were taking with regard to that program was not congruent with policy. So this was an attempt to bring the policy up to date with what the district's direction is, because we have to do what we say and say what we do. So you're correct. We went through all of the wording and said all of these paragraphs are really just saying in each of these scenarios, what gets credit, what doesn't, what's part of the GPA. And we collapsed that up into a table to make it more um, yep. easier to reference is what we've done. There. What question I have is, we, I noticed we're changing he, she to other pronouns what what is that a do we have a policy for that now or are we just starting with this policy uh no there's no no policy regarding that Thank but you. it was it certainly seemed like a very safe route to go because we're not we're, we're not producing it in a binary sense but we don't have a policy for changing that presently for a person no 
No, but I so the, the, presently we recognize he, she. We see he, she in a variety of documents and where we have the ability to actually in our student record system, as an example, mm -hmm. when someone has selected the gender with which they identify, that system will automatically replace it in the instance that's relevant to them. Since we were addressing a large group here, we went with the pronoun one. And if that's not a great selection, we have Mrs. Catrillo on to talk all about pronouns. <laughs> How did you know? That's why I'm on. <laughs> I guess you get you guess <laughs> that. <laughs> um, my only if you I, I'm fine with the student, obviously, the only thing is when we get down to the last part where it says his or her. And instead of that, we put their senior year. If we are referencing it as a student and one, then it, the there would be incorrect because that's a plural. But my thought was, is particularly if we wanted to keep it more general uh, neutral, we could just say students. And that's really what's becoming common now in writing is to pluralize everything as much as possible. Um, so, and especially the fact that we're talking about um, both evaluatory and salutatory and, and or we're talking about students of North and, high, North and South High School, um, I think pluralizing it might be even easier from a grammatical standpoint, but I don't, it doesn't matter to me which way we go. It's just that the there isn't consistent with the one, that's all. Well, my only, my only concern is if we're going, there's a lot of policies that you reference he and she, and if we're starting to do that, we should have a, some type of procedure for doing that. If we're gonna start, we should do do them all. Um, I don't think we can read them just the way they are. I think as they come up, maybe they get changed. Yeah, I think the procedure is every policy that comes up will be coming right through this process like this one, and we can catch them as we go. And so change every policy. I like I like Ann's recommendation though. Instead of one or they or we refer to them as students. We certainly can. That's why we're here. Um, students. And any any suggestions? Any uh. Any thoughts from you all? Well, the year was fine. I, I, I just think we're we're treading a little water here. I mean, if we're going to do one, we have to do them all, and and we have no procedure for that yet. And and we're just jumping ahead. I think we're putting the cart ahead of the horse, so to say. But um, it's easier than having to go back and rewrite again. You know what I mean? If you're changing them as you go along. Yeah, we have went off a lot of more. Ch just change them as we go along. Then I think. You know. I'll, I'll tell you what, we, when we get these to the point that we can search them more, more easily, the whole policy manual, that's what, yes. we're, that's what we're working there you towards. Go. If you would like, at a point in the future when we have less to do, right, maybe we could go through and show you every occurrence of he, she, because those are editorial changes. They're right. not changing the actual function of the policy. Mm -hmm. Our council would advise us just make the editorial change. You don't have to go through a policy revision and approval to change that. So if we can bring you at some point all of the he, she's in their context, right through the policy manual, and we could show you that they could be replaced with student or students at some point down the road, then you could can, you could give us that direction. That would probably be easier for us yes. to make it. I like that. I like to Okay, that. but let us, let us get there. Right now, we're still working to get them all in a format we can search them. But so for, for this today, particular- that you want student in place of he, she, in, in the proper- Or students. Okay. In place of one. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Or in the place of one or student. there, or he, she, student. Correct. I think you're going to want students only because of the there at the end, because you're Correct. saying their senior year, so you're not really going to have much of a choice. Yeah, otherwise it would be one's senior year. And so you their just senior switch to here. Well, there would in indicate a plural and it's one person. So that's why we want to make it parallel. So just let me know whether you want ones or students. I think it would be students. Students. Done. And Ann, yeah. uh, just for... Yeah. Uh, clarification, when we talked earlier today, you mentioned there was something else you were concerned with. Do you want to bring that to our attention? Yeah, it's on the um, page four. It's just a question on uh, the level two elective courses. Uh, it says offered at the high school, we see a weighted course value of 1.25. And I totally understand that when we have levels, um, and I think Amy probably know what I'm talking about, when we look at levels like two, three, four, five, like in uh, foreign language, level three and up is honors. But I just wanted to clarify that if we only have a course that has two levels, that the second level 
is earmarked as an honors course. Like in other words, we have drama one, drama two, honors. We usually write the word honors after the level two course when that particular um, subject only has two levels. So I just wanted to make sure, I didn't know if that had to go in policy so that that would definitely happen on all courses on the day that Amy and whoever does scheduling up north are no longer here. Um, That's all, you know, I just wanted to make sure that that was, I just to make sure that, that was. That. Uh, do you understand what she's saying? Yeah. She's saying? Yeah, so that was under my Can you hear her Can you hear her in? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, yes, I can. Uh, it's Amy. Here we go. <laughs> So that was something that when I first started scheduling, um, Ryan Moran was still here. We started looking at with the department meetings, what the procedure was for naming the honors courses. So from that meeting and the way our scheduling is done right now, the highest levels of the courses have the honors of uh, title to it. However, that is something that I know that we should probably go back in the buildings and just really kind of make sure that we have that consistent throughout um, when we start going, because we've been doing a, a comparison between North, South, the program of studies, and we're really looking at all of it together to make sure that we have an alignment. So this is actually like the perfect project for that as we continue to move through. Uh, but, but you're saying right now, if you only have one one group, that's, a, that's, the, that's considered an honors? So with for the way the, the Alan, you could correct me because you were in this meeting as well. The way that the policy is written is that the highest level of the level of the quarters. So like she said, drama one is not honors. Drama two is honors. Advanced strength one is CP. Advanced strength two is um, honors. But so we only have one. What is it? it would just be, um, that's where it gets kind of iffy. And that's where I say we really have to look at it because I would love to tell you that they're all CP, but there are some classes that based on when they were approved, were approved as honors. Like for example, you could take SAT prep or SAT prep honors. So I, I would like to tell you that it is consistent throughout, but it, it's not. Like there are some classes that you have the choice whether you want to take the first level I, is. You just up another case. Why would we have an SAT prep and SAT prep honors? I think a lot of that was yeah. done pre the scheduling. I mean, I, I know that's something we walked into. It's something we talked about at these meetings. I think the biggest thing that could help us as a district is when we actually take a step back and we look at each department in its own entity and we look and say, okay, um, in our we have level one, level two, level three, and we really make that across the board. Yeah, so, something like SAT, why would you have these are SAT prep are trying to get kids prep for SATs? Why would you have, have an honors and a. And I, a, can, a, answer a, that, I can, can answer that. I can answer that if you want. Huh? Would you like me to that? answer that? Yes. As the department chair, one of the reasons why that was done is if you notice where it says level one courses, Level one courses are given a value of 1.0, which is the applied level um, course. And most students who are taking SAT prep are going to be CP or above. And if you notice that with the level one, which is a lot, you know, which it depends on many of our electives, um, it really, some electives are geared more toward um, upper um, academic isn't that sorry? Isn't that discriminating against the kids that are taking? No, because if they were to, if they were to take that course, they would actually get higher credit. They would actually get a higher level. For what example, um, with like studio broadcasting, um, studio broadcasting is done on an honors level because of the responsibility. But we have applied special ed students in that, and they get the honors credit. So it's not it's it's not a distinction for the student. Uh, it's not a distinction in terms of discriminating to the student. It's a distinction to the student and the parent to understand the difficulty assigned to that particular subject area. That means an EMT course would be an honors course. Yeah. Because that's not an easy course. Yes. Because of the difficulty level. Anyone can take it. That's, that's you know, there's no right. discrimination. Uh, it, takes it. it just lets the, lets the students and parents know how difficult the actual subject matter is. 
I think when we were going through it with Sapphire, I know when I was doing my internship um, under Eric and Dr. Riker, one of the things we found is when we were looking to go to one common course code, we realized that there was a long history that is tied to Sapphire. It stretches across four grade levels that are currently taking classes. So in conversations with our Sapphire, which is our learning management system, we have to have that. We have to create a brand new course ID that's not used at North or South. That way, as we go through and we are going through each department and we are realigning this based on the curriculum rewrites and everything that we're doing, we could then establish one set system and it would actually be controlled right from the Sapphire LMS. And we would have the controls out of admin services. And that way, individual entities like the principals and the buildings, people can't make changes to courses. So that way we know that the consistency across the district will be there with the ranks. I know a big change that we made was when we brought in the soccer courses a little while ago, they had uh, CP courses. So if they took intro to business here at the building, and then they took intro to business on Osaka, they were getting an applied weight in building CP weighting in Osaka. And we brought all the courses up that their CP for the electives. So that way we are working towards that. It's just, I think it's part of the big picture. And when we get it accomplished, it's going to be able to resolve a lot of issues that we have in a lot of technology and um, a sapphire. A lot more complicated than we think. So, Mr. Carter, this is a lot of love. So, for the sake of this for, policy yes. adjustment, um, could I what, throw a language suggestion out there while we have everybody here that understands this now? If we look at page four mm -hmm. and we look at paragraph three, which is the level three paragraph, I know that you've indicated you have to go back and make sure everything that needs to be labeled honors is accurately labeled. Mm -hmm. But once that happens, would it be accurate to state in paragraph three? Level three and above elective courses and those designated as honors That's what I was gonna say, offered yes. at the high school will receive a weighted course value of 1.375 unless otherwise designated. Would that solve today's policy problem? Yes, I believe so. Could you say the same thing for level two? Yes, because if you have only two level levels. And level three, level three, not all level three. Well, they're saying, honors. right, but they're saying that if it's the level two course, it goes to one, two, five, but that course wouldn't be designated well, we as options. Just saying level two courses can be designated. As but if they are, that's where the language in that third paragraph. Or those is. designated. It says, yes, level three and above courses and those designated as honors will get the 1.375. What's an AP course? Well, that's 1.5, 1.5. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me let That's me the end of the in, the, in the course of studies, right? Mm -hmm. Do we have them listed as levels? Level two, one, level two, level three. So we have level one, two, three, and eight. I'm, right. I'm thinking of I'm the thinking of my district. I know how we level oh, them. Yeah. Um, in our course of studies, I can't think off the top of my head. Because if that's the case, then that might be a little because if it says level two honors, we're saying level three and honors. I just don't want confusion in the terminology. Well, I'm actually not saying level three and honors. I'm saying level three or honors. Right, but if in our course of study it says level two slash honors, so, so are we saying it's level two or are we saying it's level three because it's saying honors? that your honors will automatically go to the to the highest number. Correct, but we can't label it as level two. We have to label it as honors. So in our course right. of study, we need to see how we we describe each class as a level one, level two, level three. Because so if we're saying if, if drama two is considered honors, we can't label it as drama two honors because it's not level two isn't considered 1.5 because it's considered honors. Yeah. So I, I haven't looked at a program of studies in a couple of years, but we level two courses were really never, a, le a course that only had a level one and a level two never were labeled as level two. They were just labeled as the title of that particular course. For example, drama one and then drama two honors. The only time I remember actually seeing leveling was like accounting one, two, three, four, you know, um, foreign language, one, two, three, four, five, those kinds of things. But I haven't seen a course, a, a program of studies, but um, Mr. Vitulli said, uh, Dr. Vitulli said he was going to um, bring us one and show us or whatever discussion at our next EPR meeting. So we can look at it then too. I just want to make sure there's no confusion in the yeah. when, yeah. when kids are 
Yeah, I, I was trying to accomplish it with the least language change right. that was right. accurate because it's telling us if we put in that paragraph that if it's level three, it gets one three seven five, or if it's if been it's designated as honors, it's one three seven five. Okay. So a two honors would be one three seven five because it has the word honors in it. So, yeah, exactly. Are right. so you okay with that? Oh yeah, I'm fine. I just want to make sure we're yeah. Otherwise, we could be we changing. Be I, I see your point. We'd yeah. be changing the program of studies to go from a level one to a level three course with no two in between, just right. to be easier sure and confusing. I guess. And then the one question, if I could, since you're already up here, if you wouldn't mind explaining the difference between what a dual credit program for uh, ESASD is and a dual credit enrollment program, um, yeah, since they're relatively the same but they're different. Yeah, and so so if a student is taking dual credit then when we changed that this past year, that student is able to get an AP credit. So that means they get that AP rank that goes with the class. So students are eligible to, if they want to count as dual credit, that it's equivalent to an AP course and they get the GPA and the class rank um, with it. So that's a great thing that we did uh, this summer, we pushed that through and we've been presenting since the August meeting of some of the changes that that's going to have when is it, it comes to right. considered a college credit. They're always going to get a credit. It, the, the wording's a little confusing with dual credit because they both get a credit, whether it's dual enrollment or dual credit. The difference is the, the name dual credit for us pretty much means it carries an AP weight. Yeah, but doesn't that uh, the dual credit have a uh... You get college, college credit right. and high school yes, credit? Yes, they get credit for both. Yeah, so... I, what, but not so, dual enrollment. Huh? Dual enrollment. Well, credit, they different. get a credit for both if they want, but the student chooses um, whether or not it goes on there. Um, in the past, they chose whether or not they did dual enrollment yeah, if I, they want to go on the transcript. It does not count for any kind of weight, and it doesn't impact their uh, class rank or their GPA. But, but it does count for towards college credit. It it does count for college credit and district credit. And so the student credit. gets the one credit for taking, let's say, intro to communications at Northampton. They would get a credit here at South High School and or North, and they would get a credit at yeah. Northampton as well. Right yeah, and that that was really put in because we wanted to make sure we're not excluding students because there's a group of students that want that AP right that goes with the college weight of a class, but then we also have a wide array of students that also just wanted to take college classes for the experience and um, being able to do that and still get the credit. But they're all AP courses? They are, if, they, if the student signs a contract. So this year we had the student, they came in, they met with their guidance counselor and they met with the Northampton or ESU representative. They talked about the course and they, we had presentations regarding what is dual credit and what is dual enrollment. And then the student got to pick which one they wanted that would fit their circumstances the best. Um, we're pretty much half and half. Like I have about 50, 55 kids that are enrolled in dual enrollment and dual credit this year. And I would have to say I'm about half and half on who wanted to take it for the AP waiting and who just wanted to take it for the dual enrollment experience. But the dual enrollment experience gives you the, the college. And yes. Not, and the dual, the AP gives, gives you the AP and no college. They give you both. They give yeah. College. They give you both. So the, yeah. The, the, the one, is, one is simply for college purposes. And one is one is can it be applied towards your your uh, your status here as a student also? Right. The credit can allow you to do it within internally. For instance, my daughter when she took dual enrollment, she it just it was just dual enrollment. Mm -hmm. All her classes were college courses that she took. Yep. It was separate from her ESASD transcript. Yeah. Yep. And nothing carried over. But well, it carried over to the college, right? She she received very nice yeah, college credit. Right. Oh, th that's why I'm trying to get. These yeah. Courses. So we have some students that have. 12 credits right now through Northampton because uh, they've been doing dual enrollment for two years. So we do have students that definitely capitalize on that. They have their credits. They're already moving along their way with getting their credits for their bachelor's. And it's clear to the students. Oh, yeah. It's, we had a lot of meetings. It's not, it's not so clear in here, but it's clear to the students. There's um, in the program of studies, there's the addendum that went with it. Uh, the, the dual enrollment addendum that we presented in August that went through how we were going to incorporate the dual credit and the dual enrollment. Is that with the policy? And then this was just the policy implementation of having it for the um, 
the class rank and GPA, just to make sure we're being transparent to our families. Is that what the, is that what the policy, uh, uh, Eric? Is what the, the addendum? Did you, do we have that with the policy so we, we're clear on it? I'm not sure yeah. which part of that you're asking about. It's the, in the, the addendum saying how this, this whole thing works. It's in the, you're talking about the addendum of the program of studies. Is that what we're yeah. asking? Yeah, it is. Okay. It's a separate document. That's why I wanted to be clear. So, so basically, if we're looking at the table again, we tried to take all of the language, which is confusing. Yeah, that's why. And move it up to this table to accurately say, if you want to get GPA class rank and credit, your courses need to be here for our dual credit program. And a piece of that I didn't hear mentioned was the dual credit program is a specific menu of courses that students must choose from, right? That is, we're moving into that for the next You're moving in there. So that way the courses aren't duplicates of what the teachers here offer. They're courses that they otherwise wouldn't be able to take for AP credit. Then the dual enrollment is really more student-driven. Yep. They'll get credit for it here, but it won't count towards their GPA and other, other things. Mm -hmm. And you can read on down the list there. Of course, summer school courses give you the ability to get your credit and your weight and so forth. So, so the third one is a dual credit that is for the college, but the not. third one is a dual enrollment, as I see. Dual enrollment, okay. So it doesn't count towards the GPA, and it doesn't count towards the class rank, but counts towards college credit and high school credit. And these are high school credit. They always get college credit. Well, they get the high school credit because you have to have somebody. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's really important for our seniors because they need so many credits that they could stay eligible for if they're an athlete that keeps them eligible and also for some of our awards and stuff as we have written in the program of studies. But it has nothing to do with GPA and uh, it does not. No, it just and like some students they decide that they want it because they want to show their college that they're challenging themselves, but a lot of students just submit their transcripts in to the college. Any other questions for Amy? Thank the you. only other one is when we put with the I don't know what the when we looked at the one uh Eric, we looked at the failed courses that would be summer school and credit recovery, that the students would get the, the 1.0 when I did the research on that. Yeah, that's listed here. Yep. Yes. It's okay, so that's listed in there. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Any other questions for this one? No, no, no. And Keith, I've made those edits on that third paragraph. So when it does get published right away, anything we've talked about will be. All right, great. Thank you. Um, now we're on to 217 graduation requirements. Uh, looks like we're making the uh, noted legal uh, shift of references, as well as we're adding the district shall provide support, uh, provide support to facilitate supports to facilitate the on time graduation of children of active duty military families in accordance with the interstate compact on educational opportunity for military children, state law and board policy. So basically, we're we're basically piggybacking off the uh, the military uh, interstate compact on educational opportunity for military children. Yes, and our department also is um, currently has developed in conjunction with all of these other folks here a process for ensuring that there's communication in place from the time of enrollment to all of the key players in the buildings, so that they can create those graduation plans for any of the children, including these that may be experiencing mm -hmm. educational instability. So any other questions on this one? Nope. Moving right along, let's go to the new policy, which uh, education opportunity for military children. And this policy was suggested by PSBA. Is that that's where we're getting this from? This is right. Yeah, we needed to put a policy in place as a result of the law changes, and PSBA already had a model ready. The only the only question I've asked is for page two. It's saying choose one. Yes. Can you, can you clarify that? Well, before I do, it, just take a look at the bottom of page three going into page four. That is a highlighted note that will disappear from the policy, but it's the guidance from the PSBA legal team. They're recommending that the districts select the second choice, which is the uniform services, meaning as defined there, the U.S. Armed Forces Commission Corps of, the, of NOAA, as well as the Public Health Service. I can tell you after analyzing the groups and subgroups here, here's the difference. Option one does not include the Space Force. Option two includes the Space Force. And they're based on two different definitions. If you see the little three at the end of the first definition, that's based on Pennsylvania's definition. If you look in the back, the reference for that is 24 PS, which is burden statutes. 
Okay. If you look at the other two definitions, there's a four that's referencing the US code, which is what this bill came out of. Mm -hmm. So that's why PSBA is recommending taking the second option. It includes all of the same groups. It just adds the space force to it by definition of the armed forces in the US code. So we're gonna go with, uh, so option we're suggesting two. to go with the second one. Yep. PSBA is suggesting that. We just wanna hear from you, which box you want us to take. Right. I think that's I think that's inclusive right. and that's, that's your future right No, that's, there. no, that's. That's your future. Yeah, that's. They I'd rather that. go by federal state. Wait, right. Sure. We so have let's. So do we have to make a? Do we have to make a motion to approve that, or we? Just well, when we make the motion, maybe we say we specify that uh, uniform services would be the option second number U.S. Two. Army yeah. huh. The second one. Uniform well, services. I think tonight you're going to ask us in your motion just to post it based upon the revisions. Well, then add that one to the. You know, that's how we'll. Right. Yeah. So you'll and then you'll you'll strike the yeah. uh, the yellow pen. Yep. Already done. Yep. Any any other comments on this one? That was my only comment. All right, moving on to eight ten uh, operations transportation. Uh, this again looks to be yes nothing but Reference. legalese. Reference. Yep. So. There were there were code updates, and instead of typing them on the left side, we took that as an opportunity to move everything to the end. That was it. it did not change the language of the policy. Mm -hmm. So the language is staying the same. It's just a different uh, clarification as far as the state and federal suggestions. Yes. That's it. Yeah. We'll be moving them to the end to get it in the right format. Eric? Yes, sir. In which in which policy do we say that the uh, military people, kids, could wear uniforms? Military uniforms. It was in here someplace. I... It was in here this evening someplace? Yeah. Um, the only I, place... I do remember that, George. It'd be 254 if it is. Go back when they for graduation, they could do it uniforms given to them by the military. Mm -hmm. I know I saw it in here. There's a reference to uniform collection on bottom on page two of five, item six. There's a reference. Which one? Item six of what, what policy? 254. It's a two five four. Is that what it is? I'm not sure which reference you it. remember. It, it, it just said that they uh uh that the district would allow them to wear uh military uniforms. Let me see. Well, thank you. Do we we do that already, don't we? It was it was in here. It was I think it was the graduation. Oh, maybe some of the oh, okay, maybe it's the graduation requirements. I remember because when I saw it, yeah. I'll find it later. I'll find it later. <laughs> but we allow we allow students in the military to wear their uniform now for graduation. Do we not? Uh, it wasn't the uh, number. No. There's certainly no prohibition against it in our no, that's, that's policy more, more specifically. Correct. Okay. All right. So we can look at that. We can I'll find it. All right. The omission so of such allows such, right? right? I would think. All right. So let's go back to transportation. We well, we did that. We are look at yeah, that. We, we didn't do it all. We didn't see any, any changes that anyone okay. So now we're going on to this last. Uh, I'm a little confused. This is the PNN. Um, I thought that was just for our reference. This is for reference, correct? Yep, that's the policy news network newsletter. Right, that's just a reference. So, that's I, correct. You don't take any action on that at all, it's just for your reading pleasure. Okay, so then we are going to go on to. Um, public participation. Oh, public participation. Is there any public participation public? Any online people online? We have no one online. Just, just me. <laughs> uh, Mr. Roner, yeah, public. You okay with it? No. Okay. So then we're going to advisory recommendations. Uh, motion to authorize and direct the administration to post the following items. Be policy 200 enrollment in district, policy 202 attendance eligibility, policy 214 class rank, 
policy 217 graduation requirements, policy 254 educational opportunity for military children, and policy 810 transportation with the noted revisions for public review uh, during the month of January and sub uh, subsequent board action in February. So moved. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone, anyone against? Okay, we're gonna pass that. So I, uh, I wait, a motion to, any, anything else? A motion. Mo I have a motion on the floor to adjourn. I, I suggest okay. that. Look at that, Debbie, and you said it would go long, Debbie. Mm -hmm. hey, you said I talked too much. I, all in favor? We, yes. we're, we're closed, right? You you didn't beat our fastest one yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's the next one. Did we adjourn? Uh, uh, and adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>